collectively and in action changes its countenance. Now it is as though nothing is more likely to intensify our vitality than its proximity, something we are usually hardly aware of, namely that our own death is accompanied by the potential immortality of the group to which we belong, and in the final analysis of the species, moves now into the center of our experience that is in collective violence. And the result is that it is as though life itself, the immortal life of the species, nourished as it way by the sempiternal dying of its individual members, is surging upward, as Fanon says, is actualized, in the practice of violence. Now, I think it would be wrong to speak here of mere emotions. It is, after all, one of the outstanding properties of the human condition that finds here an adequate experience, that is, that individual death is survived by the species or the group. In our context, however, the point of the matter is that these experiences, whose elementary force are not in doubt, have never found an institutional political expression. No body politic I know of was ever founded on the equality before death and its actualization in violence. It is undeniably true that the strong fraternal sentiments engendered by collective violence have misled many good people into the hope that a new community together with a new man will arise out of it. The hope is an illusion for the simple reason that no human relationship is more transitory than this kind of brotherhood which can be actualized only under conditions of immediate danger to life and limb. This, however, is but one side of the matter. Fanon concludes his praising description of the experience in the practice of violence by remarking that in this kind of struggle, the people realize that life is an unending contest, that violence is an element of life. Doesn't it follow that praise of life and praise of violence are the same? Sorel at any rate, thought along these same lines already 60 years ago, and long before Carl Lawrence discovered the life-promoting function of aggressiveness in the animal kingdom, violence was praised as a manifestation of the life force, and specifically of its creativity. Sorel inspired by Bergson's Elan Vital, aimed at a philosophy of creativity designed for producers and polemically directed against the consumer society and its intellectuals, even then. That is, not against the bourgeoisie, not against the capitalist in the old sense of the world. And the reason why Sorel held on to his Marxian faith, even though he hated the consumers and consumer society and the intellectuals much more than he hated the bourgeoisie, the reason was that he believed the workers were the producers, the only creative element in society. And the trouble, as he saw it, was only that the workers stubbornly refused to play the revolutionary role as soon as they had reached a satisfactory level of working and living condition. However that may be, there was something else that became fully manifest only in the decades after Sorel's and Parito's death, 
and was incomparably more disastrous for their view. The enormous growth of productivity in the modern world is strictly speaking by no means a growth in the workers' productivity. It is exclusively due to the development of technology, and this depended neither on the working class nor on the bourgeoisie, but on the scientists. Now, to those who contemplate the immense change of our everyday world and compare it with the development of our mental categories to interpret the world, it seems as though it's much easier to change it than to change the world than our ways of thinking. For we all know to what an extent this old combination of violence, life, and creativity has survived in the rebellious state of mind of the new generation. Their taste for violence, again, is accompanied by glorification of life, and it frequently understands itself as a necessarily violent negation of everything that stands in the way of the will to live when Fanon is speaking of the creative madness present in violent action, he is still thinking along the lines of a tradition which is at least 100 years old. Now, nothing, I think, is more dangerous theoretically than this tradition of organic thought you saw it in all three, in, you saw it in power as well as in in revolution, in power, in violence, or in the, pro in the concept of progress, in the concept of power, and in the concept of violence. In the way these terms are understood today, life and life's alleged creativity are their common denominator, so that the precedence of violence is justified on the ground of creativity. So long as we talk about these matters in non-political biological terms, the glorifiers of violence will have the great advantage to appeal to the undeniable experiences inherent in the practice of violent action. The danger of being carried away by the deceptive plausibility of such metaphors is particularly great, of course, where racial issues are involved. Racism, white or black, is fraught with violence by definition because it objects to natural organic facts, a white or black skin which no persuasion and no power could change. All one can do if the chip, when the chips are down is to exterminate their bearers. Violence in interracial struggle is always murderous, but it is not irrational. It is a logical and rational consequence of racism, by which I do not mean some rather vague prejudices on either side, but an explicit ide ideological system. Today's violence, black riots and the much greater potential of the white backlash, are not, are not yet manifestations of racist ideologies and their murderous logic. The riots, as has recently been stated, are articulate protest against genuine grievances, and much the same is true for the backlash phenomena. The greatest danger is rather the other way around, since violence always needs justification an escalation of the violence in the streets may bring about a truly racist ideology to justify it, in which case violence and riots may disappear from the streets and be transformed into the invisible terror of a police state. Violence, being instrumental by nature, is rational to the extent that it is effective in reaching the end which must justify it. And since when we act, we never know with any amount of certainty the eventual consequences of what we are doing, 
Violence can remain rational so long as it pursues short-term goals. Violence does not promote causes, but it can indeed serve to dramatize grievances and to bring them to public attention. Conor Cruz O'Brien, whose name some of you will know, once remarked in a debate we had in New York, violence is sometimes needed for the voice of moderation to be heard. And I think this is a very witty, not only witty, but a quite profound witticism. And indeed, violence, contrary to what its prophets try to tell us, is much rather the weapon of reformers than of revolutionists. France would not have received the most radical reform bill since Napoleon to change the education system without the riots of the French students. And no one would have dreamt of yielding to reforms of Columbia University without the riots during the spring term. Still, the danger of the practice even if it moves consciously within a non-extremist framework of short-term goals, will always be that the means might overwhelm the end. If goals are not achieved rapidly, its only result will be that the whole climate of the country has become more violent and that the eventual defeat will bring about conditions considerably worse than those existing before. Finally, the greater the bureaucratization of public life, the greater will be the attraction of violence. In a fully developed bureaucracy, there is nobody left with whom one could argue, to whom one could present grievances, on whom the pressures of power could be exerted. The crucial feature in the students' rebellions around the world is that they are directed everywhere against the ruling bureaucracy. The dissentant resistors in the East demand free speech and thought as the preliminary conditions for political action. The rebels in the West live under conditions where these preliminaries seem no longer to open the channels for action that is for the meaningful exercise of freedom. The transformation of government into administration, of republics into bureaucracies, and the disastrous shrinkage of the public realm that went with it have a long and complicated history. And this process has been considerably accelerated during the last hundred years through the rise of party bureaucracies. What makes man a political being is his faculty to act. It enables him to get together with his peers to act in concert and to reach out for goals and enterprise which would never enter his mind, let alone the desires of his heart, had he not been, had he not been given this gift to embark upon something new. To act and to begin are not the same, but they are closely interconnected. All the properties of creativity ascribed to life in manifestations of power and violence actually belong to the faculty of action in general. And I think it can be shown that no other human ability has suffered to such an extent by the progress of the modern age. For progress, as we have come to understand, it means growth, the relentless process of more and more, bigger and bigger. The bigger a country becomes in terms of population, objects and possessions, the greater will be the need for administration, and with it the anonymous power of the administration. Pavel Kohut, K-O-H-O-U-T a Czech author writing in the heyday of the Czech experiment with freedom defined a free citizen as a citizen co-ruler. He meant nothing else but the participatory democracy of which we have heard so much. Kohut added 
that what the world as it is today stand in, stands in greatest need of may well be a new example if the next thousand years are not to become an era of super-civilized monkeys. Now, this new example we may indeed stand in need of will hardly be brought about by the practice of violence, although I am inclined to think that much of its present glorification is due to the severe frustration of the faculty of action in the modern world. It is simply true that the riots and the ghettos and the rebellions on the campuses, it has been said, make people feel they are acting together in a way they rarely can. We don't know if these occurrences are the beginnings of something new, the new example, or the death pangs of a faculty that mankind is about to lose. As things stand today, when we see how the superpowers are bogged down under the monstrous weight of their own bigness, it looks as though the new example will have a chance to rise, if at all, in a small country or a small, well-defined sector in the mass societies of the large powers. For the disintegration processes, which have become so manifest in recent years, have crept into everything designed to serve mass society. All public services are afflicted with it. Schools and police, mail and transportation, traffic on the highways and in the big city. Bigness itself is afflicted with vulnerability. And while no one can say with any assurance where and when the breaking point will be reached, we can observe, almost to the point of measuring it, how strength and resiliency are insidiously seeping from our institutions drop by drop, as it were. And the same is true, I think, for the various party systems, all of which were supposed to serve the political needs of modern mass societies in order to make representative government possible where direct democracy would not do because, as John Selden said, the room will not hold all. Now, I could add, but this is too far away from your own experiences, the recent rise of nationalism everywhere, which is usually understood as a worldwide swing to the right, but evidently also a swing away from bigness and centralized government. Again, we do not know where this development will lead us, but we can see how cracks in the power structure of all but the small countries are opening and widening. And we know, or should know, that every decrease of power is an open invitation to violence if only because those who hold power and feel it slipping from their hands have always found it difficult to resist the temptation to substitute violence for it. Thank you. Carl Jaspers in his book on Marx the one that I'm referring to is Reason and Anti-Reason. In his book on whom? On Marx, Reason and Anti-Reason. Oh, yeah. He stated in that book that the assumption that history was, in its essence, progressive, and that therefore the ends justify the means, rested on mistakenly connecting two terms, dialectic and causality. My question is <clears throat> that if one makes this connection between dialectic and causality, is it inevitable that one will also make the connection between violence and power? That's a very good question. And uh, give me one moment. I'm afraid, yes. You know, I, I'm afraid that wherever you have this dialectical continuity, 
in which nothing new can happen except, you know, that everywhere there you have violence as a kind of marginal phenomenon of power, you know, but still it's the same as power. You see, the, le the left says, by which I mean all Hegel, you know, uh, whether they are left or right, the left says violence is a marginal phenomenon of power. Yeah. Power is behind it. But uh, it is the same. It's one of the modes, but a marginal mode. The right says what is behind all power is violence. Let's face facts. Let's be realists. All power ultimately is violence. You know? The, uh, the assumption is the same. You know, as far as my problem goes, it doesn't matter. Because that is, uh, their power becomes, so to speak, a marginal phenomenon. You know, do you see that? So I'm afraid the answer is yes. But uh, if you think about it and you come to a different conclusion, let me know. <laughs> Yeah. Stated before that you considered racism to be an explicit ideological thing. Uh, when you said explicit, this is, first of all, contrary to Marcuse's idea that it's actually implicit. Yeah, quite, quite, yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, to be explicit, doesn't this have to question consciousness? I, to be ability of having an ideology. It, by, racism, by racism, I don't mean, uh, see, uh, let's take the, uh, the Jewish business. There were many anti-Semites, let's say, throughout history. Yeah? There is many people who didn't like Jews for all kinds of reasons. Also for reasons of bodily features. This I would not call racism. This is partly antipathy, partly prejudice, etc. This you can change because it's an, you, you know, an isolated phenomenon. When I say racism, there you had suddenly people who had no dislike of Jews whatsoever, but who had been become convinced of the argumentation of racist theorists. And this, that is, this kind, this is no longer a kind of feeling. This is a kind of, a, a, well, of ration, not rationalizing, but it, it is really a kind of reasoning. And there, this kind of reasoning has a logic of its own, and the logic is murderous. The logic is murderous, you know. Then you say, if you agree about this or, or that, the scientific assumption, then it follows from it that this and that should, be, should happen. If you agree that uh, Jews are a bad uh, part, of mankind as a whole, then you must, no matter what your feelings are, agree that Jews should be exterminated. And now, you, if you have friendly feelings towards the Jews, you should overcome them. You see? That is racism. And that is something altogether different uh, from saying, I, uh, I don't like Jews, I don't like Negroes, my sister shouldn't marry either, you know, uh, and anything of that kind. That is only opinion. But an opinion and an ideology are really two different things. What I am afraid of is this. See, violence needs justification. And I am afraid that if a real black-white race struggle would break out in this country, both sides would feel that they need justification for what they are doing, and then the justification would be racism, and then the whole thing would really become murder. 
you know, much more murderers than occasionally riots from <coughs> interest groups here or there. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? If, uh, no, I'm not clear what you're using this enough. If you're using ideology in uh, the sense that man might find it. No. 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 See, uh, Mannheim, uh, see, uh, Mannheim, use, uh, Mannheim use of the term ideology really comes still from experiences long before uh, we actually knew what ideologies are. See, Mannheim formulated ideology and utopy, you know, um, in the early 20s. I know it because I was, so to speak, around. <laughs> You know, uh, not in the, uh, the late twenties. Uh, you know, I know him quite well. But uh, uh, this has—he uh, did not yet have either the Stalin or the Hitler experience. And uh, to understand the real murderousness of ideology, this particular side of it, and then to define it according to these phenomena, you really needed the totalitarian experience of the 30s. How, how is that experience then outside of the definition of this theory which helps to maintain the status quo? I didn't understand that. My, I may be misunderstanding the term ideology, but I understood it to mean, to mean that which represents the status quo, which is the Yeah, no, 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 no. That is the way Marx used the word. Now, if you use it, if we use the word differently. We say an ideology is every doctrine which tries to explain everything from one single idea and to have a key in its hand for the full clarification and illumination of everything there is. You know, that is finally the full development of ideology. The way uh, Marx, you, uh, you know, the term was first used in, uh, uh, during, um, uh, during, uh, by destroyed, uh, uh, in France, during, the, uh, uh, during the Nap uh, Napoleon I, you know, he spoke of the ideologue. But, uh, and then the thing slowly developed, uh, the word, and the term, you know. And uh, it was then used by Marx, uh, not uh, uh, Mannheim sharpened the use in which Marx used it, yeah? the way in Mar which Marx used it. And then actually the, what it really was came to the fore only in the 30s, in the totalitarian regimes, where really ideology for the first time as such played a decisive a role in the body politic. That is where it was not just used to justify this, that, or the other, you know. Single, uh, you could, for instance, uh, kill uh, the Duc d'Anguin, as Napoleon did, and then uh, uh, justify it or excuse us with a reason of state, yeah. That this was one single item, you know. Whereas here, ideology goes through the whole body politic. This was never there before, in the sense of a national socialism or a communism. I don't mean that the national socialism used anti-Semitism as a chief ideology. Now, anti-Semitism existed, of course, before. Before it was used in its... Uh, in this sense. So communism, socialism existed before Stalin used it. But only in this, when I talk about a fully developed ideology, I mean that it is in this way politicalized, so to speak. It is in the body politic. And this you have, for instance, to give just one more example. See, you had in Germany something very curious. And uh, it's uh, at first glance really very ridiculous. 
every germ, in order to say that he is a germ, had to prove negatively that he was not a Jew. <laughs> now, imagine, 70 million people uh, against 500,000, yeah? And now every, everybody had to show his ancestors, yeah? There you have, how, there you have it, how ideology becomes an institution in totalitarian state. And only then do I speak of fully developed ideology. Hmm? Yeah, <coughs> you come later. Can you go back to the first ideology? Didn't you speak about ideology that you put into the Western world? That is the reason that they are the flight? No, we don't call that. Look, you, you call all these things. You, pardon? No, I wouldn't know. If faith is a religion, is not an ideology. Look, all these terms we use here: ideology, imperialism, totalitarian, dictatorship, tyranny, etc. All these words are used in a very loose way. You will hear that if somebody uh, uh, doesn't, uh, is not in a, for instance, some president of a university is in disagreement with the students and he is being accused of being totalitarian. Well, the most he could be was being tyrannical. More he couldn't even, you know, even if he wanted to, he simply couldn't. And uh, so we use all these words in specific, well-defined ways, because otherwise we do, otherwise they apply to so many phenomena that they have no, uh, you know, they are like an umbrella under which you can uh, put everything, and it, they have no long, you do no longer know what you are actually talking about. We want always to know, when we use a term, the real phenomenon, down to earth we are talking about. Then we use a term as a kind of shorthand. But this we cannot do if we, do if we, if we have not first uh, matched them as a square, you know? Yeah. One thing say is a viable alternative to the party system of government. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I will say this. I don't know, but I will say this. Uh, republics and democracies existed before the party system. You know. Where? What? Where? Well, in antiquity, in America, in France. Do you know how old the party system is? Oh, I thought the party system originated in Greece. No. Well, well, I don't know who told you that. The party system originated about, uh, uh, about 130 years ago. These were the first beginnings of it and actually developed at the end of, uh, from the middle to the end of the 19th century. Uh, that is the truth of it. That is the moment you talk about the party system. One thing, what we have today as a party system, one thing please be, be absolutely clear about, that we talk about a very recent phenomenon. Now, we, no. <laughs> Yeah, that, but this I'm afraid we cannot uh, we cannot argue about because this is a, 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 you can use the word party again in a very loose way and then it will apply everywhere. You can uh, you know not only to the party to which we go and drink whiskey, but uh, also uh, uh, there are several parties, namely people of different opinion. Parties in the sense of party bureaucracies in order to make possible election for office and, the, and in the sense of representative government is one of the, and please uh, try to read the history about it in order to get clear about it. We cannot clear that up here. I mean, that is the, uh, yeah, what do we want?
If you want to say something. So I don't you see the, uh, the emergence, the very recent emergence of the party bureaucracy uh, as nothing but a natural outgrowth of a more historical phenomenon of representational and class values. And specifically the representation for the purpose of getting elected and for the purpose of achieving certain ends in a parliamentary and bureaucratic system. Actually, this has, in my opinion, nothing to do with uh, the class business. It, had, it has to do with bureaucracy. And bureaucracy, unfortunately, uh, developed everywhere, in every single uh, sphere of our life. And once a bureaucracy has developed, it is very difficult to get rid of it. But one thing is clear. Our problem is representative government, and we have very little notion of what we actually mean by representation. But that this election uh, methods, which we have, and which originally came up with the party that then, that, that then developed into bureaucracy, this election system is not necessarily the only way to elect representatives. It is one way. And it would be worthwhile, or there was one other thing proposed ever, and that is, of course, a council system, which has a, the, a, a altogether different principle, but has within itself also the principle of representation. Now, which is necessary because, as I said, the room will, will not hold all. But they are all participate in one way or another. Now, whether this system would work, we don't know. Each time it came up, it was pitched already against parties, particularly since the, uh, uh, since the Russian Revolution. And all parties have, first of all, every organization has one thing that makes a tick. It does not want to disappear. So the parties immediately fought for their very life and survival, and up to now, either the right or the left has been has, uh, defeated uh, this other possibility. But this does not mean that it is possible. So my question was based also on a very recent historical phenomenon. Aren't the criticisms Certainly, the active criticisms which you gave us about parties have been used as the justification for the emergence of totalitarian and fascist systems in the last 20, 30 years? No, I don't see it. That is, I, you know. Uh, I don't deny uh, the totalitarian systems, but uh, uh, I, but that's the, you know. There's something else plays a much bigger role than the party and that is secret services, but let's not go into that. Yeah. I think I see the connection between Jasper's statement and my question and something he said during the lecture. But I think what he was trying to say is that those people who connect history and progress, causality and dialectic, what they're trying to do is they're trying to describe a process and they're saying that this process has its cause within itself. Isn't yeah. this precisely what those people who define violence as power or define violence as <clears throat> an organic function, isn't this precisely what they're doing for they're not describing what violence is, but they're getting around it by implying that it has its cause within itself ah. and leaving it unexplained. That's perfect. That's perfect. True. That is what we actually have to snap out is this whole processing thinking. You know, that is, of course, what it all. Uh, and these processes, uh, just to underline once more, are almost always thought of as biological, organic processes. As though if we act and something happens that could follow in any way these natural, you know, uh, these natural laws, and uh, it would really be uh, important. So um, it's very difficult to talk even about these things and to eliminate, as I try, all organic metaphors because they have crept into our language. It's a very old story. 
and the actual started already with Aristotle, if not with Plato. Uh, it is uh, it is not only an old story, but it, it seems such an easy way, you know. And if you begin to think about it, you see it's murder. Yeah. You already. Right. You yield. In the beginning of this lecture, you said something about the uh, natural instinct of man to be aggressive and to his basic need to uh, obey, <coughs> basic need to command. Can you repeat that? Now, I said that these people said that uh, I, uh, I quoted John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill said, man has one inclination, that is to command, and one disinclination, that's to obey. And I would say that man has at least a, a, a third inclination, namely to obey. And that is by no means a disinclination. And I, that is that this is much stronger in human psychology than these people think it is, you know? Do you think that man basically wants to obey? No, I say most people basically want to obey. And I said once, uh, uh, one more step. I said those who want to obey usually also want to uh, command. You know, that usually goes together. You want to... <coughs> that is, uh, if you want to read a classical passage on this, please read Herodotus. The third book, chapter 80 following, that is the first a discussion of the forms of government. And uh, there you hear finally uh, one man who does not want to become king because he says, I don't want to rule and I don't want to be ruled. And that is, of course, a spokesman in Herodotus for Athenian democracy. And Herodotus adds, somebody else was then chosen king, Darius was chosen king, and they have discussed which is the best form of government, monarchy, oligarchy, or democracy, you know, one, and he said, no, 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 no rule, I don't want to rule, I don't want to be ruled. And then Herodotus adds, and his house remains the only free house in all of Persia. <laughs> it is the perfect definition of what, uh, what freedom is. So, no, 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 first. Uh, in analyzing totalitarian societies, you concentrated always on uh, Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia. I wonder, how do you characterize other societies uh, which seem to be something more than tyranny and less than totalitarian? For instance, uh, fascist Italy, Franco Spain, the Union of South Africa. Let's leave the Union of South Africa out. Yeah? And, uh, <laughs> if you will, yeah. And, um, I would say Franco-Spain, even Franco-Spain, uh, Italy, uh, one-party dictatorships. Uh, of course, we have the word fascism from there. All right, then let's call it fascism, but then let's call Hitler's dictatorships with, by some other word. You know, because it's, these are party dictatorships. And see, you see it immediately. Uh, if you want to, to, uh, to apply it, you know, uh, the one, as I see it, distinguishing feature is that the party immediately occupies the state apparatus. <coughs> they put all their members into the, uh, into the government. Whereas all totalitarian systems have two, or at least more as effect, uh, authorities, the party, the state, the elite group, the police, etc. You have always this, multi, uh, this proliferation, yeah? Whereas you, there you see that, and then you get new laws. But these laws are laws, they are not being changed. There's a law in uh, Russia as well as in, uh, in Stalin's Russia as well as in Nazi Germany, as you know, could change from day to day. There was no law. And that is a, it's a great difference. And I assure you, uh, for your own well-being as an individual, it's very unpleasant to live under a dictatorship. 
or a tyranny or one party dictatorship, but it is paradise compared to living under totalitarian dictatorship. Yeah. Would you elaborate on your statement that uh, without injustice there's no violence? Because I think this I didn't say. I said rage is provoked by violence, by injustice. I said the normal reaction that is the normal reaction to injustice is rage. It is not the normal reaction to suffering and misery as such. But you see, suffering and misery can also be construed as unjust. No. If an earthquake would shake, now this, and we would very much suffer, you know, a, a real earthquake, you know, uh, unlikely, and <laughs> I agree. Uh, uh, nobody will, will, uh, will fly into a rage. And there may be uh, as much suffering as from an atomic bomb if the, uh, if the earthquake is big enough, yeah? What? Madhouse, hypothetically, Madhouse is blown down by a cyclone, a cyclone, and he is going to be angry. Uh, he'll personify his rage on some dominant figure. Some yeah, but that would be a rational. No. If a man's house goes down an earthquake, he, if he is angry, he is insane. He is, by the way, we know, we know about these things so much that we know very well that people do not react with anger. Or, or with rage to such, uh, uh, to such uh, happen, uh, uh, incidents. But <laughs> that may be, then you have a bad temper, my dear. But <laughs> <laughs> that is not what we are. Yeah. You've made some comments on, on man's natural inclinations. Where would you classify Rousseau's uh, idea Well, I wouldn't classify to begin with. And um, do you mean that man is good? Well, you know. Uh, uh, man is good, but society is good. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, that is a proposition. And it is only one of the propositions, by the way, which Rousseau made. You know, you see only one side of Rousseau. Rousseau was a very interesting fellow. He could change his mind many times. Uh, I don't believe in that, you know. I don't believe in either the proposition man is evil or the proposition that man is good. I would say man has a capability of being either good or evil. Or, and he usually is something in between. And uh, uh, the uh, point of the matter is really not... Uh, the, the, uh, it's what, what I was talking here about inclinations, you know, you can go, uh, you know, inclinations, you can... Uh, enumerate until you are blue in the face, you know, you go and study psychology. And uh, uh, I took out just what was relevant to this question of command and obedience. And my only point was that will to power, which is so much taken for granted by everybody today, uh, uh, is by no means such a simple business. A will to power and will to submissions are really un interconnected, but this we couldn't touch here, you know, or just mention. So Rousseau really has no... Let's, let him leave him out. Let's leave him out and let's not classify him. See, I, he is not one of my favorite authors, but after all, he is a great author. Let's not classify great authors. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you had an opinion on perhaps some of the reasons why uh, Herbert Marcuse's works recently, within the last few years, have gained such widespread appeal. Yeah, I think that's very simple because of this life business. You know, because Marcuse, uh, uh, who knows Marx quite well, and Hegel, 
and being uh, uh, combined uh, once more, Bergson and Marx, that's what he actually does. And just as Sartre uh, tries today to combine existentialism and Marxism, and just as Sorel already tried to combine uh, 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 Bergson and Marx. You know, uh, everywhere this attempt uh, to combine the two, and it can be combined because of the curious organic metaphors in Marx's own work. Because of this business, <coughs> violence is the midwife, and so on, you know, of history. Uh, uh, etc. There is a common denominator, and the common denominator is, of course, our, uh, I uh, cut out um, here when I was, uh, our whole tradition. See, when, they, when you read uh, treatises about power, you always will hear one thing, that power must grow. If it doesn't grow, it rots. It decays, it rots away, you know. Against this stands the great discovery of Montesquieu that power can check power and both powers that check each other can remain intact, you know. That is that you can limit power without destroying it, which of course is one of the chief uh, uh, problems of all political science. Yeah. Are you of the opinion that the various nationalisms which have emerged in the last two decades are a sign of decentralization? Yeah, look, uh, no, of a yearning for. See, my uh, real, I wouldn't say of the last decades, but of the last few years, as a matter of fact, uh, because you see, you, you have the nationalism of uh, ethnic groups that want to rise to nationhood. That's one thing, yeah? But you have something very curious. See, all the big nation states, England and France especially, were a uh, symbiosis, an association of different ethnic tribes. The, uh, of ethnic, ethnic groups grew together into a nation. And this growing together actually made the nation state. It was a business that went over centuries until the nation state finally arose. And what do you have now in the best established nation states, which certainly are uh, France and England? Uh, you have in, in England all of a sudden the Scotch and the Welsh. Uh, of course, there were always such fringe movements, and they were more or less uh, the movements of the lunatic fringe. Uh, but now it's no longer they are real, it, there's real trouble. And, uh, and, so, and you have the same, I mean, de Gaulle wanted to split Canada. Uh, well, before he knew what he was doing, the Provençal and the Breton told him that they want their own autonomous nation state, you know, uh, in France. That is, if, if Paris and London, a centralized government and capitals, really, the, uh, uh, well, if you really want to know what a capital is, you must know London and Paris. As a, you know, in political terms, and also in in other terms, if these capitals can no, if that if there the center cannot hold <laughs> anymore, you know, that is really something. Then you see the fragmentation of the continuing process, and not just of it's not a question. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know, but it's very curious, isn't it? Yeah. Do you say there's any parallel between this and the growth of uh, feudalism? Uh, feudalism was the opposite. I mean, uh, feudalism there, you had small entities. You mean, is this a return to feudalism? No, I don't think so. Because it, 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 after all, feudalism is also an economic system. 
and uh, you cannot have feudalism in an urban civilization. See, you do not have this trouble in Denmark. You do not have such trouble in Holland. You, yeah, you have it in Belgium, but there, uh, really, uh, this is a very young a nation a state, you know, I think 1800, uh, what is the sign? It is 30, I think, or something. I, I am not sure. Uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, last century. And rather artificial. Just a piece of France and a piece of Holland were combined. So Belgium is really, you don't have it even in Switzerland. There are a few uh, uh, slightly insane uh, people uh, in Geneva, I guess, but these are real, this is more or less the lunatic fringe. You don't have it in small countries. And for heaven's sake, so in uh, Switzerland, there are three uh, different people living together in peace. And, um, uh, so you have it in the in the larger countries, and it's curious. It seems to me one of the cracks in bigness. So I thank you very much. Let's.